referenced uh, earlier today, uh, the challenge that, challenges that we face in understanding and mitigating the systemic risks across the food, energy, environment, water uh, sectors are existential in character. With another three billion people added to our planet in the coming decades, we're going to get down to some really basic, basic questions that need to be answered. Where are we going to get enough food, energy and water from to sustain our species? Never mind any other species, right? but in the first instance ours. So these are difficult questions. But the first thing that I, I want to point out, and this very much reflects the thinking behind our network, is to recognize that many of the challenges within each of these sectors, and indeed understanding those challenges across those sectors, the thinking has been done by a great many people. Right? We've spent a number of decades understanding, or trying to understand, and eventually understanding the way water systems work, for example the way energy systems work, the way trade flows work, and what the consequences might be for decisions in one sector on the other sectors. Many of the people in this room were at the forefront of that research or practice. So there's an awful lot of knowledge out there. So in my remaining seven minutes and 10 seconds, uh, I might be so bold to suggest that there are four fundamental problems that we already know exist and that need solutions. And the good news is that while these problems are difficult and complex, we can actually cut through the complexity, and we need to cut through the complexity to get to the answers. And while the answers are administratively difficult and politically contentious, they are at least known. So let me go through those four particular challenges and their possible solutions now. The first, and this will come as no surprise, is governance. The problem, the overarching problem, is disjointed, inefficient, and often opaque governance structures and processes that fail to account for those relationships that exist between those critical sectors, food, energy, environment, and water. So what we have as a consequence is very confused and often conflicting policy objectives emerging from a whole range of different governance scales whether they be local, regional, bioregional, catchment level, national, international, or even coming out of international bodies like the World Trade Organization. So what we have is a very confused governance landscape. This is not an oversight by governments or the administrative arms that service them. Rather, if we examine each of the four sectors closely, it's clear that there's an institutional logic that characterizes each of these sectors. And that logic is about history, it's about culture, it's about ideology, it's about statutory requirements, it's about regulatory design. These sectors are fundamentally different. And one of the things that, that you notice very quickly is people introduce themselves often as, I'm a water person, or I'm an energy person. Oh, I do food, <laughs> right? Now, it's admirable in some ways, it means We've, we're part of a club, but as soon as you have clubs, you have silos, and when you have silos, you have conflicting objectives and outcomes. Add to this the disaggregation of governance processes, the uh, emphasis on markets and market-based instruments to achieve public goods, the divestment of key water, energy, and agricultural assets to private entities, and the result is an institutional landscape that is a veritable maze of actors and competing objectives. Now I'm a political scientist, which means I wake up thinking about the state and I go to sleep thinking about the state. So it will be no surprise to you to know that my feeling and our feeling on this is that a state is an incredibly important part of the solution. If we're to understand and to actually enact better integration across these four critical sectors, what we need is more authoritative steering from the state. So that's message number one. The second is prices. The prices for food, energy, and water do not accurately reflect their true scarcity, their value to society, or their environmental and economic costs in production and consumption. It's much easier with food and energy, uh, sorry, rather with water and energy than it is with food. Uh, as we've seen and discussed already today, you can have massive uh, food 
spikes, which are not good, but in the main, food itself does not, ref the prices for food, the administered prices for food, do not reflect their, uh, the costs uh, produced. So the consequence is reduced incentives for users to conserve resources and to use them efficiently, or indeed for there to be much innovation in the way producers produce these products and supply them across the supply chain. This is not a new message. Economists have been banging on about this for decades. And there are two particular messages that need to get across. One, we need to incorporate the externalities imposed uh, in prices. And two, we need to stop subsidizing activities that make all of this a whole lot worse. The third area is in regulation, and that is that states' environmental regulation and associated risk management frameworks are not sufficiently robust and flexible as to account for cross-sectoral impacts. To put it another way, ladies and gentlemen, there is no regulatory trigger when we make decisions in the food, energy, environment and water sector that says what is the likely impact on the other sectors. We do have regulatory arrangements that can offer that scope. For example, environmental impact assessment and strategic environmental assessment. These are well accepted, often enshrined in law processes that entities can use and should use by law, but they're not used well in many different countries, including my own. And again, the effectiveness of procedural tools such as strategic environmental assessment or indeed the introduction of standards better licensing arrangements around, for instance, hydropower, or targets around energy efficiency. All of these things, which could be used to manage these cross-sectoral risks, are the preserve of the state. So my message again is that ultimately we need a long, hard look at what role the state plays in managing these systemic risks between the four key sectors. And finally, we've touched on it already, the fourth problem is insufficient, incomplete or badly communicated knowledge and information on the risks and consequences of mismanaging the critical sectors that we're looking at. I want to say very, very quickly that it is almost certainly not a deficiency in knowledge that is the problem. Rather, it's the lack of fit-for-purpose data and decision support tools that can be readily used in policy and investment decision-making. In some ways, it was our, our friend, uh, where are you from? Here. Here. Friend. Gosh, really? Um, <laughs> I thought it was going to be somewhere exotic, but we're already here. Um, uh, who was saying, we need the one-pager, right? We need to have that fit-for-purpose information. If you're talking to a minister, it should be fit-for-purpose. Uh, heaven knows we have enough tools and we have enough models. But there is no consistent common approach to the collection and publication of data, nor any standard for compatible formats to inform the viability and the feasibility of various solutions. So, so when you're a policymaker, science should be one input, not the only input. But if it's going to be one input, then you need to be very, very sure that you've identified and communicated well those trade-offs. And that is far and away our primary objective. I would just leave you with one final thought. Uh, in my day job, I spend a lot of time looking at trade policy. And it strikes me that we probably could learn something from the way trade negotiations are conducted. When governments sit down to negotiate a free trade agreement, either in the WTO or bilaterally or regionally, they have at their fingertips an enormous amount of fit-for-purpose data about which sectors can afford to be liberalized and to what extent, and which sectors are so vulnerable to imports that they need to be protected, although we don't always call it that. Right? But these are fit-for-purpose databases that you can very quickly draw on. If we, if we reduce the tariff by this amount, this sector is likely to be affected this amount. So I just leave you with that. Four problems, many solutions, very little complexity.